Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Ryan and I'm a former Royal Marines Commando from the United Kingdom. And today we're going to be reacting to Putin's insane plan if Russia takes over Ukraine. Keeping up with the topic of Ukraine, guys, I think this video is going to be a pretty good one to react to. It's from the Infographics Show, so please go and show them some love. They're a fantastic channel. And guess what? Without them, we wouldn't be able to do these reaction videos that you so enjoy. Um, but before we get into it, a little bit of admin. If you don't mind liking the video, smashing that subscribe button. And if you're a return subscriber, thanks, guys. I really do appreciate the continued support. Um, before we get into it, I just want to apologize for the lack of content over the past few weeks. There's been so many moving parts on the channel. I'm currently outside of the United Kingdom at the moment. I have got a setup. It's a mobile setup, but the internet is absolutely terrible. But no excuses. Here I am today, and I'm trying my best to get some content out every single day until I get back in the UK, which will be in the next couple of weeks or so. But apologies that this isn't the same background and things like that, but we'll be back to our studio very, very soon. But if um, yeah, guys, thanks for the support. I really do appreciate it. But hey, let's get into this video. Let's go. In 1991, Ukraine declared itself independent as the Soviet Union collapsed around it. For years after, the new Russian Federation struggled to find its footing. And for a small time, there were hopes that the Cold War could be left in the past and Russia would find its way to embracing better relationships with the West. Uh, well, I'll be honest with you, from that point, they should have done just that. It should have been a change of mindset. They should have went, you know what? Time for a new future now. We need to get on with the West. We need to work with the West. We can make a lot of money. The relationship, the, the Russian people can can benefit from this, but they chose to stay in the old ages. I think a little bit of bitterness stayed in um, in the, the old USSR, the modern day Russia. It certainly did with Vladimir Putin, ex-KGB agent. That mindset is going to be really, really tough um, to change, that's for sure. However, those hopes were dashed with the election of President Vladimir Putin a Cold War-era Soviet spy who was still stuck with a Cold War mentality. For Putin, the Soviet Union might have collapsed, but the dream of Soviet greatness wasn't dead, and the one thing standing between his dream and the new Russian Federation was the West. In Putin's eyes, Russia was forever locked in a zero-sum game with the West, and there could only be one victor. As the Soviet Union disintegrated, newly freed Soviet republics and former client states immediately sought out membership in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. For those former republics and client states, it was the only way to guarantee their newfound independence after decades of brutal rule and oppression by the Kremlin. I mean, if you look at that map there, a lot of there's a lot of green granted, but these are the every country not other than Russia. If you look at the size of Russia and the dominance it had globally, they've got quite a good um, position on the world stage anywhere. Now, if they utilized their natural resources, if they utilize the hard workingness of the people who live in Russia, and um, they've, got, they've got a lot to give the world, right? Let's face it. If they utilized and managed those relationships more effectively, they would have been in a much better position now than they are currently. Um, and it's almost a bit of a shame, you know, that they haven't done that for the sake of humanity, all right? At the end of the day, it's better to get along with people than the other, um, than not to, you know? The Soviet Union might be gone, but nobody had any illusions about the Russian Federation suddenly wanting to be BFFs with the world, and the election of Vladimir Putin only reinforced a growing need for NATO membership. In 1990, NATO had promised that the alliance would not expand an inch to the east, yet this was before the collapse of the Soviet Union, and clearly meant that the alliance wouldn't seek to expand into East Germany. And things have changed in... 30 years, guys, all right? 32 years it's been since that point. The world is a very, very different place. Now, you look at how the technological advancements has changed, not only the structure of how countries work, but mainly in this situation, the militaries of how these countries work. The militaries now are so much more advanced than they were in 1990. And I generally believe from what's going on in Ukraine, what we can see, Russia hasn't really moved on since 1990. And to be fair, a lot of the stuff they were using then was actually outdated and um, and, and the technology that they were using was, was actually quite old in, in, in some circumstances, not all. So when you think about the fact that they haven't really moved forward since then and the rest of the world has, they're actually really, really far behind now. I don't even class them as the second, third, fourth, fifth world's biggest superpower. They might be in terms of numbers, but in terms of effectiveness, they're nowhere near a top five, maybe it's even top 10 country in terms of how effective they can be. Um, what do you think about that? Let me know in the comments, troops. While the nation was divided, there had never been any discussions about NATO not expanding eastward toward Russia's borders after the collapse, as confirmed by Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev. That doesn't mean that Russia didn't warn NATO about expanding, 
It's just that there was no formal agreement against expansion. For Russia, NATO expanding eastward triggered fears of past historical invasions of Russia by foreign powers. The nation has suffered greatly from foreign invaders, and thus after World War II, Stalin worked hard to ensure that Eastern Europe remained under his influence. Europe was thus divided along Germany, with the Soviet Union controlling everything in Europe east of Germany and using it as a security buffer between itself and the West. The buffer mm. served two purposes. First, it was a physical barrier to invasion. After both German invasions and the invasion of the French during the Napoleonic War, Russia suffered great loss of life and damage to its economy. Eastern Europe was now. Right, I'm going to change to a different scene to talk a little bit more about this. Uh, it's something that actually really bothers me when I look at um, the statistics of the death toll in World War II anyway. It was absolutely mind blowing. All right, the amount of human life that was um, sacrificed, that, that was lost due to stupid um, acts of violence, war, all of that good stuff. It was just an insane amount of people. But when you look at the statistics of how many Russians died during World War II, that, that, that number is astronomical. Um, it's disgusting. We, we talk about so, certain, uh, we talk about certain groups of individuals who suffered um, in World War II, and we definitely should continue to talk, talk about those groups of people who suffered. But the, there's a definite group in the Russian population don't really get a mention. Um, the amount of Russians that died at the hands of, um, you know, the, the, their enemy, at the hands of um, their government, at the hands of their own military, at the hands of starvation, um, degradation, se segregation, everything. There was loads of problems in, um, in Russia at the time. And the amount of people that died was unbelievable. The biggest group of people, actually, that died in World War II was actually belonged to Russia, it was the Russian people. So we've got a bit of a short memory in that respect. And um, it just goes to show their government has been failing the Russian people since World War II, even beyond that point, all right? But mainly in, the, in modern day history, certainly, um, the Russian people have been failed. And it's about time that change happened there, all right? We need out out with the old way of doing things. You know, Putin, he needs to be gone, really. We need a new way of thinking in that land because there's some promising people coming from there, all right? Some talented sportsmen, some intellectual businessmen. We've got some great people in that region, and it's a shame that they're not being able to be showcased all because of their corrupt government. Now a shield that protected the motherland, with any would-be invader having to pass through the entire Soviet bloc to reach Russian lands. Even better, millions of Eastern Europeans would themselves be thrown into war to protect the Soviet Union, placing the nation in the strongest position it's enjoyed since the heights of the Russian Empire. But this barrier was also an ideological one, meant to keep Western capitalist influence away from the Soviet homeland. The power of the Communist Party depended on keeping Stalinist ideology alive inside the Soviet Union. Liberal Western values and democracies threatened this. This has never been more true than it was post-2000s, after Vladimir Putin's rise to power. Liberal Western values are now seen as an infection in Russia, because they threaten President Putin's absolute power on the Russian government. For Putin, Russia today is under assault by Western culture, and he spent great efforts in waging a propaganda war both within and outside its borders. The last thing Putin or his elites want is a free, democratic Russia, and the only way they can prevent the ever-brewing political unrest amongst the population is by creating boogeymen out of the West to unite the Russians against. Starting in the early 2010s, Ukraine now wished to draw itself closer economically and politically with the West, much to Putin's dissatisfaction. At first, there was a wish to be more economically tied to the West to ensure Ukraine's prosperity. But as Russia exerted more pressure on Ukraine, a growing movement to formally join NATO grew inside Ukraine. Putin attempted to suppress this desire through intimidation and by using prop. We've seen that throughout the whole world with these, um, not just political leaders, but we, we go across the whole world. We look at gangs, we look at businesses, we look at um, associations. It doesn't matter what it is, all right? It could be groups of people. Um, a lot of the real political persuasion happens with bullying tactics. And Putin, you know, he, he's used this scaremongering fear tactic throughout his whole reign in Russia. And the reason I don't think that works effectively as he believes it does is because you're going to surround yourself with one type of person and one type of person only. That's someone who's going to agree with every word you say. Now, Putin doesn't know everything. He doesn't know everything, guys. He might be an intelligent man, but you need to surround yourself with people who actually know more than you. That's one thing that people get wrong with business. 
if you look at a business, big corporations, you, you look at big successful businesses, normally the man at the top isn't the one who knows everything. Normally the man at the top has the ability to understand that he doesn't know everything and he needs to employ people below him who knows a lot more than him in those certain areas and aspects of business to be able to make it run more effectively. That's how great businesses work. Now, Russia isn't necessarily a business, but they've got a lot of decision making that they're poor at at this moment in time. And that becomes there's only one person really making key decisions here and that's Vladimir Putin. What he needs to do is surround himself with good people, better people, people who know more than him to be able to make better decisions instead of having people surrounding him just agreeing with every word he says at the fear of death. It doesn't work. Um, it's continued not to work. Has he went too far down that rabbit hole? I think he has. I don't think he's ever going to change. Old dog, new tricks, never happening. Propaganda inside of Ukraine, even by infiltrating its government. In 2014, the situation came to a crisis point when President Viktor Yanukovych of Putin's stooge refused to sign a free trade agreement with the European Union, which would have drawn Ukraine deeper into the West's fold both economically and politically. Instead, President Yanukovych ignored the Ukrainian parliament's overwhelming desire to sign this agreement and chose to draw closer to Russia and the Eurasian Economic Union, headed by the Russian Federation and made up of former Soviet states. The result was immediate as protesters took to the streets in a full-blown civil insurrection through Kyiv into chaos. The Ukrainian people had freed themselves from Russian rule and had no wish to go back to being a mere client state, and brutal clashes took place between protesters and police. The revolution of dignity as it came to be known resulted in the occupation of the government buildings across Ukraine and the expulsion of President Viktor Yanukovych from power. Soon after, Yanukovych went into exile in Russia, and Russia responded to the coup by taking Crimea and supporting the right, so that shows one thing one intention that this guy obviously if he's going to russia he had his um his best interest in russia in the first place so it's probably a good idea that he got the hell out of business breakaway provinces of luhansk and donetsk russia orchestrated pro-russian demonstrations in sevastopol and four days later russian troops without insignia stormed into the parliament of crimea and seized it while other wow. russian troops took key strategic sites along the peninsula with the peninsula secure, the Russian Federation installed the pro-Russian Sergei Askinov into power. Shortly after, there was a referendum that resulted in 97% of voters choosing for Crimea to be absorbed by the Russian Federation. Perhaps unsurprisingly, those votes were never verified by any independent agency, and the United Nations voted overwhelmingly to consider the referendum illegal. Wow. Thus, to this day, internationally, Crimea is still considered as belonging to Ukraine. But with Vladimir Putin threatening to use nuclear weapons, nobody sought to use military force to liberate the occupied peninsula. This is the thing, let's talk nuclear weapons for a start, for a second. There's been many different opinions thrown about in the news on various different channels that I follow and all of that. My opinion has always been this. It's been used as a massive scaremongering tactic and it's worked for a long period of time. I do believe people are waking up to this though. I do believe that people aren't buying into this whole nuclear warhead thing as much as we used to. I mean, we just have to look at the infrastructure that Russia has bringing to the table in Ukraine. A lot of the vehicles that have been shipped out today, like over the past week or two, a lot of these vehicles were used 30, 40 years ago. Some of them older than that, some of them 50 years old, they're being shipped out on the front lines of Ukraine. What does that tell us? That tells us that a lot of the things that they've got have either broken down or unusable and they have to use an, having to use old kit to satisfy the demand on the battlefield. Now, if that's one, if we if we look at the fact that they're at, at war currently in Ukraine, they're fighting and they're, and they're having to resort to that. What does that say about their nuclear warhead arsenal, their capability? Is it, are they as capable nuclearly as we once thought? Or have they got a load of nuclear warheads that are downgraded, haven't been maintained properly, and are just left in the corner somewhere? Because I'm starting to think that that might, that might just be a possibility. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. It's an interesting topic, but... At the same time that Russian forces were seizing Crimea, Russia's infamous little green men, so-called for their green insignia-less uniforms, moved into the separatist regions of Luhansk and Donetsk, working alongside separatists and even engaging in fighting themselves. Russia denied allegations that its military was in the separatist regions, but the ruse was all but given up over time, as even Russian armor joined the fighting against Ukrainian forces. The Donbass War, as it came to be known, would rage until 2022, culminating in Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The real question is, though, what does President Vladimir Putin really want to do with Ukraine when the war is all over? The answer depends on how the war ends. I think 
thinking a little bit bigger. If he's he, he's allegedly coolly at this moment in time as well. I don't know if that's true or not. We 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 can only surmise, can't we? But. I don't think it stops with Ukraine if he's successful there, which I don't think he will be, but I don't think he's going to stop there. I think he's going to have a look at Ukraine and just say, look, we've took this over Moldova, for instance, just south, easy target, can't can't defend themselves, let's take that as well. And if he does that, I think he's going to move on to the next country that he can do. I think I think this doesn't stop, but you've got to understand the mindset of this guy. He's not just going to take this one step. With him, it's all or nothing. And I think he continues to try and make Russia, what it used to be, which is insane to think that he thinks that he can do that in this day and age. The least likely way that this war ends is with a full occupation of Ukraine by Russian forces. Initially, Putin claimed that he had no intention of occupying any part of Ukrainian territory and that his advance on Kyiv was merely meant to remove what he called pro-Western Nazi government from power. In the early stages of war, this might have been true. Putin may truly have not wished to physically occupy Ukraine and instead settled for installing a puppet government. This would turn Ukraine into a client state, much like Belarus, without the hassle of having to pacify an inevitable insurrection by physically occupying it. It would also achieve its grand aim of weakening NATO by denying it yet another member, especially one situation. But the thing is, weaken it to what extent? To what extent does he think he's going to actually weaken NATO? I mean, we're talking about, you know, it, we, just look at the main players in NATO, America, United Kingdom, you've got France, you've got other countries who are formidable in their own right. Even if those three countries I've just mentioned joined together without the others, that's a formidable, massive threat to Russia. Now, we look at all the rest of these countries and what they can add. We need to look at it logistically as well. Logistically speaking, these other countries might not be able to offer as much in terms of their, um, in terms of their funding and budget. But what they can offer is a platform to launch other countries' weaponry and munitions and, and militaries from. So let's just take um, Estonia, for instance. If you can launch from Estonia and, and utilize that country with, um, you know, just keeping your forward fighting force there and training, so to speak, you've got a massive capability to be able to launch pretty close in Europe to anywhere else you want to go. So we need to think logically about this. NATO membership doesn't have its benefits, not only just with the fact that the sheer numbers of countries involved, it has other benefits for the big, big key players within that, all right? Being able to launch from these friendly countries, so to speak, it's way bigger than we'd ever imagined in that respect. And someone like Putin, he should know better. But the fact that he doesn't tells me he's not of the right mind, which kind of links into this whole thing that is he actually as um, healthy as we think he is. You know, he is an old man. People do get ill and he doesn't look very healthy in the media as well. He's quite fat. His face is bloated. Is his decision making as a result of being unwell? I'll leave that to you guys. ...situated right on Russia's soft southern belly. However, as the Russian advance into Kyiv faltered and then failed entirely, Putin's strategy seemed to radically change as well. Accepting that he would be unable to take Kyiv and topple the government, Russian forces instead focused on breaking out of the separatist regions and seizing the all-important Ukrainian southern coast along the Sea of Azov. With this coastline firmly under Russia's control, Vladimir Putin now has a land corridor from Russia straight to Crimea, and Crimea's water supply can no longer be threatened by Ukrainian dams as it happened after the annexation when Ukraine blocked Crimea's drinking water in retaliation to the invasion. This land corridor, however, also gives Russia complete control over the Sea of Azov, essentially turning it into a Russian lake. Putin's forces now try to push north and west out of the land corridor and seem to want to take as large a chunk of Ukraine as possible. What's more important, however, is extending a corridor to the west all the way to Odessa and the Moldovian border. This would give Russia complete control over Ukraine's shipping ports and thus allow it to choke off Ukraine economically but also allow it to link up with its forces inside the Moldovan breakaway region of Transnistra. Russia currently has 1,500 personnel there, and it's greatly feared that linking a land corridor across southern Ukraine will allow it to move more forces into the region and eventually take all of Moldova. This will. We've talked about that. We just mentioned the fact that Moldova is an easy target. Um, yeah, I just they see that as an obvious escalation if they were to ever um, take over Ukraine. Just can't see them doing it, though. I don't see the world stage allowing this to happen. Russia control over half of the Black Sea and extend a security buffer out from Russia's vulnerable southern regions in case of a war with NATO. It's now certain that Putin wishes to completely annex occupied territories inside of Ukraine, as starting May 1st, the ruble was introduced as the official currency in the occupied areas that remain relatively stable and in Russian hands. Street and building signs were also all taken down and replaced with their Russian equivalent. 
and Russia guaranteed the pension payments of Ukrainian pensioners living in the territories. Even more importantly, Russian state TV was brought to the occupied territories, allowing Russia to feed those living under occupation a steady stream of Russian propaganda. Putin's goal is now territorial expansion, and it seems as if his plans for Ukraine hinge on what happens next in the war. Russian forces seem incapable of truly taking the whole of Ukraine, and the commitment by the West, especially the United States, to arm the Ukrainians makes it a complete impossibility that Russia will be able to take over the entire country. However, Russian forces may be able to seize that all-important land corridor to Moldova and take Odessa, even though this is in question seeing as three months into the war, Russia is yet to bring Mariupol under its full control. Further, Yeah, they are struggling in Mariupol. There's um, been heavy resistance from Ukrainians. I think Putin underestimated the resistance full stop. I didn't think he would re I didn't think that he thought that foreign countries and foreign intervention would happen to the extent in which it's happened. We look at how much money has been pumped into Ukraine from America, from Great Britain. We're talking about billions and billions and billions, all right, being pumped into that country. And that's just money. We need to look at the weaponry, munitions, expert advice, you know, we need to look at um, the tactics that's been shared and specialist equipment as well. We're looking at other countries giving them support in the air, support with artillery. All of these things just make it's really, really tough for Russia to win in Ukraine. And the more they struggle, the more that the foreign intervention is going to happen, okay? I just don't see them winning. The West, Kherson is a critically important city to capture, and as of the writing of this video, Ukrainian forces are launching successful counter-strikes against Russian forces around the city. This makes a breakout to Odessa extremely unlikely, but this isn't Russia's only problem. Corruption and incompetence across all levels of the Russian military have resulted in massive casualties and great loss of equipment in the invasion. The effects of these losses on Russia's ability to continue fighting are only compounded by the astounding amount of sanctions levied against Russia by the international community. Of greatest importance, though, are those targeting Russia's foreign reserves, which fund the war and of which half have been frozen by Western governments. Of second most importance is the complete ban on selling electronic components to Russia, which are desperately needed by its military to rearm itself. Yeah, and there's other things that aren't getting mentioned here. When we think about technology, if there's a mega big push for um, certain technology in certain countries to be able to get on, if one country falls behind, they don't just fall behind in one or two ways, they fall behind in many, many ways. Um, I see this being a major threat long term for Russia if they, I mean, they're going to need these chips, right? You know, these, these electronic chips that run pretty much everything, cars and stuff like that, it's only going to be a matter of time before they actually say, yeah, you know what, we need this technology. Um, and this, unless they've got the ability to manufacture these things themselves, which, you know, a lot of the natural resources that go into making these chips in the first place um, reside in countries outside of Russia, they're going to struggle anywhere, and it's only a matter of time. I don't know what his long-term plan is. Maybe he doesn't care about the long-term plan, because he's probably expecting not to be on this planet anymore, okay? Um, and I don't mean in an Elon Musk to Mars way. I mean, he probably hasn't got much year, many years to live. You know, he's an old man with 21st century weapons. Already Russian drones and other advanced weapons are being discovered with computer chips ripped out of coffee makers and dishwashers. Wow. And Russian jet fighters have been discovered with commercial GPS devices taped to the dash. Which, which I may add is absolutely disgusting. It's disgusting guys. With the West feeding Ukraine a steady diet of high-tech Western weapons and with Russia's own stockpile of advanced equipment drying up, it's becoming increasingly impossible for Russia to truly win inside Ukraine. It really As is. Europe is committed to an incremental ban on Russian energy imports over the next year or so. Good. Russia's economic situation will only grow more desperate, and its ability to continue this conflict will be in serious jeopardy. Russia is thus likely to attempt to settle the war by holding onto territories it's managed to secure, adding them to the Russian Federation, and weakening Ukraine. Ukraine itself has been willing to compromise by becoming a neutral nation, with neutrality enshrined in its constitution and thus seeking no closer ties to the West. However, Ukraine wishes to have guarantor states sign this neutrality agreement mm -hmm. with nations legally bound to come to Ukraine's defense in case of another Russian invasion. Yeah. Yet, as reports of Russian brutality against civilians continue to surface from occupied areas, Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky has stated that he is less and less interested in such a deal. Ultimately, unless Russia achieves some miraculous battlefield reversals, Putin's future plans for Ukraine may not matter at all. Now go watch what's wrong. That's actually crazy. So in, in, in actual fact, having a guarantor 
is effectively the same. They're not allowed to be part of NATO, but we want um, a guarantor for other states of our choice to be able to protect us in case of a Russian invasion. It's kind of like the United Nations anyway. It's kind of like being part of NATO. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I don't know, man. If Russia agreed to that, then they're stupid anyway. But what do you think of it, guys? Look, I've been talking for 25 minutes. Let's hear your input. Drop a comment below. Thanks for being here. I love you guys. And yeah, I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Before you go, smash the like button, share this content, and subscribe to the channel. Peace.